We're going to the next one. Right? Yes. Is your microphone still on? I am greenlit. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now it's moving. Let's try again. We'll see. Okay. So for anyone that is watching this video, there might have been a bit of a shaky transition here as we we edited because we had a bit of a technical issue. Um, but I'd like to get into some of the historical backdrop for the papyri that I'm focusing on today. So we're at the 21st dynasty, which is the very beginning of Egypt's third intermediate period. Now, this is a really interesting time in Egyptian history for me especially, because not only am I interested in identity, I'm interested in how individuals can navigate their social identity in times of crisis and decentralization. And boy, the 21st dynasty doesn't fail on this front. Um, this is the time period immediately after the Egypt's new kingdom. Right. So this is after Tut, after all of the Ramesid kings with Ramses the Great. Right. After all of this, all the kings in the va Valley of the Kings, uh, we fall into the 21st dynasty, which is a time of economic collapse and a bit of a truncated kingship. So what we see happen politically is a lot of, uh, of fragmentation. The Tanite kings in the north are really relegated to that delta area. They rule from a city called Taunus, um, and they don't have much influence over the southern part of Egypt. And what we see happen is the Theban priesthood, the high priesthood of Amun, takes control of the south of Egypt. They do this politically, economically, and socially, and we can see in the archaeological and material record some evidence of how they, they go about this uh, rise in power. They use a lot of royal iconography as their own, right? This is the first time in Egyptian history we really see anyone outside the king himself use a cartouche to encircle his name, right? That's normal, normally a sign of, of just the king, perhaps, um, well, during the Amarna period, we see Nefertiti in some form, right? Also use a cartouche, but it's, it's very much a royal uh, marker. Here we have the high priest of Amun also using such a marker for his own name, right? So we see um, the royal iconography start to move into the high priesthood. And we also see them economically take control of the area. They are going into the Valley of the Kings and inventorying, right, these royal tombs. And while they're there, they might be taking a couple really nice shiny things and repurposing them and reusing them for their own burials. Um, and so that's what we see going on in the south. And this is something that the Tanite kings in the north no longer have control over, right? So we, we see the, this priesthood really take control of this area. What, what else can we see in the archaeological record to showcase this um, economic decline and the political instability that, that follows? Well, we can see things like defensive burial practices, right? And this is a term uh, that Karakuni really coined. Um, in understanding how funerary materiality shifts from the New Kingdom into the 21st dynasty. Uh, here you can see on the left of the slide a, a good example of a Ramesid uh, private tomb. This would have been, or the entrance to one, right? So this is a marked space on the landscape. There would be cemeteries where these would be very visible, right? A courtyard where family and other associates of the deceased could come to give offerings, right? There would be an accessible tomb chapel, but all of this would have been very visible and known as far as the location is concerned. In the 21st dynasty, that becomes a huge problem because there's an uptick in tomb robbery, right? And, and there's a general sense that the tomb must become a more hidden place if it is to remain safe. So instead, we get in the 21st dynasty things like cached burials, where dozens, if not hundreds, of bodies could be interred in a single and hidden location. Now, what this means is you suddenly have a lot less space for your internment, right? You can't bring all the stuff with you into the afterlife, the canopic jars and all of the furniture and the linen and the wigs and the cosmetics and all of those things. You really have to truncate your funerary assemblage. And what we see happen is the coffin set that is being used and is still used in the 21st dynasty acquires a lot of the iconography that you would have seen on tomb walls, 
right? Because we now no longer have beautiful decorated tomb walls. So an example of an 18th dynasty coffin, you can see a lot of blank space that isn't being utilized by a lot of decoration. In the 21st dynasty, you can see that the, these coffins are now really heavily packed with a lot of funerary iconography. And another place to put that funerary iconography that is quite useful are papyri, right? So, so there are Funerary papyri existed well before the 21st dynasty. This is not a new invention, but it, what is new is how widespread they become, right? So a lot of the type of Book of the Dead material and Amduat material that you could have uh, put on your tomb walls in earlier dynasties, now you have to put closer to the body in a very abbreviated funerary assemblage, and you're putting it on papyri. So out of my, da my data set includes 557 of these funerary papyri. Now that doesn't equate to 557 people because some people had more than one papyrus. So as you can see here in the example, both of these papyri belong to a woman named Gawit Session, right? So she had two um, and so it's less than 557 people, but I have 557 documents to work with. And what I would like to share with you today in terms of how I study these documents and some of the things that I came to learn through, through this study um, are there's an emphasis on state temple titles um, that previously we haven't seen the elite of Thebes utilizing nearly as much. Um, the second thing that I want to cover today is that funerary papyri are in fact a defensive burial practice and we're going to see exactly what role they played right in in that practice a little bit later in the talk. And then the third thing I really want to highlight is that women for the first time in Egyptian history had burials on par with men. Um, when you think about it, when you think back to that family tomb that I showed from the Ramesid period, that was built primarily by a man and for a man right and his wife would have been buried in that tomb by virtue of her relationship right to her husband um, now when the funerary assemblage consists only of a coffin set surrounding a singular body and the papyri that can be included in that coffin set now women are being buried as individuals instead of being buried as in relationship to someone else right and so now that women have more agency, what are they doing with that agency, right? That's a great question that we can look at for the first time um, that earlier dynasties just don't show us that type of evidence, right? So turning first to this uh, emphasis on temple titles, um, I want to backtrack a little bit and take a look at what's going on in the New Kingdom and break out the 18th dynasty from the later Ramesid period. So in the 18th dynasty, when you have pretty much the height of Egyptian power when it comes to the pharaoh, right? This is, you know, the time of Tutmosis III and Hatshepsut and, and, you know, King Tut and all of that. Um, the majority of titles that elite individuals have preserved on their tomb walls, right? Because now we're dealing with a lot of tomb decoration, are titles that relate to the king and the palace. Right, so almost three quarters of those titles relate to one's relationship with the king, and the remainder um, focus on the temple. That flips in the Ramesid period, right? So now we have the vast majority of titles focusing on temple titles, right, and not the king. And why is that the case? Because when you think of the Ramesid period, Ramses the Great, surely he is a, a very stable ruler. Right, and, and, and there's no need to shy away from being associated with his leadership, right? But if you look at it a little bit more closely, um, what we see happening is I think there is already an instability when people, when the, the elites of Thebes, um, when they think about kingship. Um, when you think about the Ramesid period, that begins with several illegitimate successions, right? The Tutmosid family is now no longer in the picture. They have died out, right? And so now we have a king that is starting a new dynasty, and they are not necessarily, you know, part of that old regime that instills a lot of confidence and trust, 
right? And so we see people shifting away already from this notion of, of connecting to kingship as an avenue and a path to power in and of themselves and connecting to something that they see as more stable. And that's the temple system, right? So I see this shift already happening in the Ramesid period. Along with this, titles become more hereditary and we can see this in the types of, of family members being listed on tomb walls, right? So the number of family um, that are listed by name in an 18th dynasty tomb was around three. It averaged around three per tomb and only a third of those had any titles associated with them. But what, what do we see happen in the Ramesid period? Well, that number shoots up. So now we have uh, on average around eight and a half, right? Uh, eight or nine people listed per tomb. And the majority of them now have titles. And those titles are becoming hereditary in nature, meaning that the Pharaoh no longer has the power and authority to appoint certain people to temple positions. Those people are saying, huh, uh, I'm giving this to my son. Right, You, as the king, no longer have the power to say, my son can't have this, I'm giving it to another family. So we see a decline in the power of kingship in the Ramesid period as the priests themselves take more control. And so when the, 21st, when the economic collapse happens in the 21st dynasty, those priests are, are really poised to take that control in the south because it's already been building up to that point where the king and king has less authority in that region already. So what do we see in the 21st dynasty papyri, right, that are a continued extension of this practice? Well, I see a lot of patterns between temple rank and references to family and, and the people that are more highly ranked, that have more prestigious positions within the temple, they tend to mention their family a lot more. And that makes sense if we're thinking about this in terms of a hereditary aspect, right? And men, obviously are the ones that seem to emphasize those hereditary titles a little bit more than the women. And then I also wanna take a look um, in this portion of my talk at some of the decorum in providing these titles. And the examples that I wanna look at here are what's going on with the mothers being listed on papyri and what about spouses, right? Because I, I talked a little bit earlier about how women are, are kind of being buried as individuals rather than as the spouse to someone else, right? Um, so how is that reflected in the well, first, when I talk about higher ranking titles and the tendency for those papyri to have more family members listed, what do I mean by high ranking? Because that's largely subjective, right? So when I'm looking at these types of titles, I'm looking for things that indicate hierarchy and authority over others, right? So things like the chief singer of Amun, where they are obviously uh, supervising other members of that choir, right? or something that is clearly numerically ranked, like a third Hemnetra priest of Amun-Re or a second Hemnetra priest of Amun-Re, versus things that are simply like mistress of the house, which is a title that almost every married woman had, or a simple Wab priest or Hemnetra priest that doesn't have a ranking associated. Those, those I would consider to be standard titles, whereas the high ranking ones indicate some sort of authority or numerical ranking within the temple system. So if we break it down into those two categories, out of my 557 papyri, when I look at the high ranking people, um, they list a lot of family and the majority of those family members have titles associated with them. When you look at standard titles, they also list a lot of family members, but not many of those family members have titles listed, right? And this is for men. If we look at for women, we see a very similar thing. The high ranking women list family with titles much more so than the women with standard titles who still list a lot of family members, but most of those family members do not have any titles. So let's take a look at a specific example of this to see what's going on. So this is a gentleman named Padiamun. He is the deceased, he is the owner of this funerary papyrus, of which you can see an excerpt here of him and, and his ba uh, seated on an offering table in front of him. And everything you can see here in yellow is his name and titles, right? So that takes up the majority of this portion of text, right? He is a God's father, the beloved, the chief of secrets of heaven, earth, and the underworld, the opener of the doors of the sky of Ray and Karnak and secrets of heaven and sees what is in it. He's a great seer of Rhea, 
and Atum in Karnak. He is a Setem priest of the horizon and a Hemnetcher priest of Amun, right? So he has a lot of accolades going for him here. He then lists his father, and you can see that in green. And his father has a fair amount of titles, right? Um, but not nearly as many as the deceased himself. But the titles that the father does have are replicated with the son's titles, right? The, the son, uh, or the, the father clearly gave the son all of the positions that he had within the temple, right? And then he goes on to even include a grandfather and a great grandfather. And we can see that both of them also had similar positions within the temple, but not many, right? So they're just a god's father and a chief of secrets of Amun, both the grandfather and the great-great-grandfather. So what's going on here? I think uh, what we see is a version of the very traditional Egyptian trope of doing more than one's predecessors. And in this case, because we're dealing with a family, this is, I did more than my father. I was greater than my father, right? And we see this from the old kingdom onwards with like tomb autobiographies saying, I, I achieved more than my parents. I achieved more. And the king says that too. I achieved more than my father, the previous king, right? So this is a very traditional Egyptian trope. Um, what I think is most interesting in a case like this, when we're looking at a text on a papyrus, um, papyri are, are great indicators of what I would consider to be um, documentary evidence of, of the complete picture or the complete thought. Because you aren't really limited in space in the way you are on a coffin or a tomb, right? It's paper. You can always add more sheets if necessary, right? You, you very rarely have to abbreviate or truncate a text on a papyrus in the way you would if you're trying to place it somewhere specifically on a coffin or on a tomb wall. So had they, if they had wanted to include more about the father, the grandfather, and the great-great-grandfather, right, if they actually had more titles than, than what was preserved here, I think they could have easily done that. So I think this is a conscious choice of really wanting to emphasize the deceased and the accolades of the deceased and showing that he did, in fact, achieve more. Now, we can, we can question whether that's the truth or a lie, right? But we can't question, I think, the motivation behind portraying it in this light, if that makes sense. Um, so, and, but I, and I will show you some examples later of where they clearly did run out of space for very specific reasons, but here I don't see it as being one of them. Um, so now I want to shift a little bit and talk about that decorum, the practices in providing titles that I alluded to earlier. And I first want to turn to the issues of mothers titles. And interestingly, we don't see many mothers being listed with titles on papyri, right? So I, I again broke it, broke it up between men and women just to see if there were any differences. I don't really see any. No men list their mom as having titles on their papyrus. Um, all the mothers are completely untitled. And if we think the goal of having titles preserved um, is hereditary, then that makes sense, right? Like a man is never going to inherit the titles of his mother. He's never going to become a chantress of Amun, right? Um, so obviously that is a piece of information that they deemed to be not necessary. But what about the women, right? A woman could potentially inherit the titles of her mother. And, and there might be a case where that is in fact going on because we have three women that do include the titles of their mother on their funerary papyri. And the first is an example of a woman named Tayu Harit, which I think could be, just like with Padi Amun, that trope of I achieved more than my mother, right? So she's showing that she has more titles than her mom, right? And so she is a mistress of a house and a chantress of Amun, as well as a chief singer in the choir of Mut. And her mother is just listed as being a chantress of Amun and a mistress of the house, right? So this could be a, a case where she wants to highlight that she advanced further within the temple system than her mother did. The second example is where I do think this is, an, is evidence of them potentially running out of space. Um, because Nessie Kansu, she lists herself as a mistress of the house and chantress of Amun. She then lists her mother as having those exact same titles. And then the very end um, has Sat, which is the indication that a third generation, that means daughter of, 
So I think whoever was uh, writing this text wanted to include a grandmother, a, a third generation, and they did run out of space. And the reason they ran out of space is because this is the beginning etiquette of the papyrus. You can't add more to the beginning. You could, if, if this text occurred later on in the document, you could have potentially spaced it out better and included you know, more papyrus to finish your text. But you can't do that when you have hit the very beginning edge of the document. So I think this was meant to be an indication of multiple generations, not necessarily of advancement through the generations because both mother and daughter had the same titles, but just to showcase some sort of family lineage on the mother's side that this person deemed to be important. Right. And then the third example, unfortunately, I can't draw any conclusions from. It's a woman named Jehutiu, but I haven't seen this papyrus in person and there are no published photos of it. So um, Andre Novinsky in the 1980s, he said that Jehutiu herself had no titles listed, but that her mother was a mistress of the house and had that singular title. But without seeing the actual papyrus or photos of the papyrus, I don't want to confirm that that's accurate because a lot of time because Andre Novinsky studied the papyri along with the associated coffin sets at the same time and he published a year apart two volumes one on the papyri and one on the coffins and a lot of times he took information that he gleaned from the coffins and he put it with the information for the papyri right so he could have and I don't know if there are associated coffins with this papyrus or not but if he knew that the mother had a title on a coffin, he would just kind of include that to give a full picture of the individual, but not necessarily an accurate reflect reflection of what was written on each particular document of the funerary assemblage. So I can't really say um, with any certainty what's going on here. I, I next wanna turn to other family members and particularly the spouses that we see included. Um, so again, I broke it up between men and women to see if we can see anything different going on. We really can't. Both men and women tend to emphasize their fathers, and some include those titles, some do not, and we already broke up the higher ranking versus standard titles and, and saw how that breakdown occurs. Um, some have multiple generations of including grandfathers and, and things like that. Um, mothers seem to be listed primarily without those titles, as we just saw. But the most interesting thing for me are the spouses, right? Very few wives and husbands are listed on these papyri, even though we know a majority of these people were in fact married because we have other texts from this time period that talk about different po property contracts and will contracts and, and we know the genealogies of these people, right? So very few papyri actually mention the spouse which I find very, very interesting and indicative of the fact that people are thinking more in terms of an individualized burial rather than the burial of a couple or an extended family lineage. So next I wanna turn back to the concept of the defensive burial practice and really see how papyri fit into that. What, what is their specific role um, with these defensive burial practices? Well. I see them as being a very strategic reaction to coffin reuse. And I think here the type of reuse is very indicative of first, whether or not a coffin set will have papyri associated with it or not. Um, and I wanna get into second, a little bit of the reasons why I think that might be the case, that some types of reuse uh, tend to have coffins or have papyri associated with them while other types of reuse do not. So first, in terms of that strategic reaction and, and to give you a little bit of an orientation to coffin reuse, if you ever saw uh, Professor Karakuni speak about her studies into coffin reuse, you have probably seen this slide or a version of this slide. This was her aha moment. When she was a grad student, she was studying Ramesid coffins and she came across this example in the British Museum of Mudhotep. And you can clearly see on the shoulder of this coffin lid, the layers of decoration. You can see the earlier decoration underneath and as some of that plaster from the later decorative layer fell away, you can see so beautifully the stratigraphy of this coffin, right? And this was her aha moment where she said, okay, a lot of these coffins 
are probably reused and now I just have to find it, right? Here's another great example to show you a very different type of coffin reuse. So this doesn't deal with a new decorative layer, but this is an example of name reuse on a coffin. Um, this is the coffin of either Isidem Heb or Nessie Kansu, right? It ended up being Nessie Kansu's, but originally it was for a woman named Isidem Heb. Um, and you can see here on the side of this coffin lid, um, I expanded the photo and at the top, you can see the Osiris Isidem Heb is listed, right? A along with an image of the deceased. But hopefully you can all see here on this bottom uh, image, a, a very, um, scratched off area where a new name, the name of Isidem Heb has been erased and a new name, that of Nessie Kansu, was written over top of that area, right? So you can see it's a different hand. You can see how messy it is. It's not as, as cleanly varnished, right, as the rest of the decoration. Now, what's going on here, right? So this is a, this is a different type of coffin reuse where a simple name could be erased and a new one inscribed. Right, and that coffin could be used in the funeral of another person. Um, we can say either one of two things occurred. Uh, they just didn't get around to erasing Isidem Heb's name in every location, and that's why two different names are preserved on this coffin. So that's one thing. This is just not very thorough of a job. Or perhaps they left Isidem Heb's name in some places on purpose as a sign of respect to her to give a nod to the fact that um, this coffin was reused by um, Nessie Kansu, but we don't want to obliterate Isanem Heb entirely, right? We'll never know which of those two uh, scenarios was true. And, and maybe if you look at the big picture of all coffin reuse, probably both situations were true at different times, right? Sometimes the goal maybe was to erase completely a previous owner's identity, and sometimes maybe it was to preserve. So we're never gonna know the true and full motivations behind this, but this is just another example of the type of coffin reuse that we're looking at. But coffin reuse, I think most interestingly and most importantly for us to remember, is a gradient, and that a gradient of success. Right, and on either ends of that spectrum, we can't detect the reuse, right? Um, on the one hand, if you don't do anything to the coffin whatsoever, and all you do is take out a body and put in a new body, but you don't change any of the names, you don't change any of the decoration, you make absolutely no augmentation whatsoever, how are we gonna know that that isn't the person inside, right? The original owner. We will never be able to detect, detect that just from looking at the coffins. On the other end of the spectrum, if you break down a coffin to just simple wood pieces and rebuild it from scratch, right? That's also very, very hard to detect. And um, the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge has done amazing work with CT scans and MRIs where they can kind of see the dowel holes and how that piece of wood must have been used in another way, you know, previously. So they, they've made great strides in that, but largely to the naked eye, you're never really gonna be able to tell if something was truly rebuilt completely, right? So those are the two ends of the spectrum. But papyri can be very helpful here. So this is, this is a great example of um, a, coffee set, a coffin set of Nessie Isit, and there's really no decorative reuse to be seen on this coffin set. If you read the names that are preserved on the coffins, it is of Nessie Isit. But um, the papyrus, is for another woman, right, Ancus Moot. And so we can tell that this coffin was reused at least once, right? That Nessiusit was taken out, and at some point Ancus Moot was put in. And they didn't do anything to the coffin, but they had her funerary papyri included um, in her mummy wrappings. And you can see that as they started to unwrap the, the mummy, they found it lying across her legs, right? And that clearly identifies the deceased, and therefore we can definitively say that this coffin was reused, even though we wouldn't have any other indication otherwise. Now, I want to get specifically into a few different types of reuse to see how papyri could be utilized in these situations. And, uh, you know, I already gave several examples, but here you can see um, with Kara Cooney's work a lot of the different types of coffin reuse that she has identified, everything from, from decorative reuse uh, to the wood modification to seeing that the lid and case don't match up in, in terms of the ledges, right? That um, some of them have like 
a stepped lip. Some of them are flat. Think of it as when you're trying to match up the lid and bottom to your Tupperware and they you find a lid that just doesn't quite fit, right? So we see those types of things happening. Um, but I want to look at name reuse, gender modification, and ramacid markers. Those are the three that I want to take you through here. Um, gender modification, as you can maybe um, anticipate, is an extensive reworking of a lot of the features, the art historical features of a coffin, right? So traditionally during the 21st dynasty, male coffins could be identified by a, a male style of a wig um, that allows the ears of the deceased to be exposed. He will have a beard and fisted hands that are crossed across his chest. Um, a female coffin will have a different style wig, a female wig that hides the ears, but sometimes allows round earrings to show through. Um, there will be breasts underneath the wig lappets, and she will have flat hands that are crossed on her chest, right? So you can imagine manipulating a coffin to change it from a masculine to a feminine coffin or a fem feminine to a masculine coffin takes a lot of effort and reworking. You have to pop off the hands, put on new hands, change the ears, change the wig, change the paint style if you can only really hide the stripes of the male wig and change it to, you know, I mean, like, so you see all types of inventive things occurring, but it takes a lot of effort to do this. Changing a coffin that was originally used in the Ramesid period also takes a lot of effort. A Ramesid coffin traditionally would have one bent arm and one flat arm instead of two that were crossed on the chest. You'll see more modeling and contours of the body than you do in a 21st dynasty coffin. And oftentimes you'll see like exposed feet, sometimes wearing sandals, whereas a 21st dynasty coffin doesn't show the feet and the toes, right? It's just a, a more um, uh, pedestal style base to, to a 21st dynasty coffin. So again, that's a lot of effort in the reworking to, to change a coffin in such a way as these two examples here. And you can see some of the, the feet of a Ramesid um, foot underneath the more pedestal style, um, hidden underneath that 21st dynasty decoration, right? You can see all of these types of examples um, here. And what I find is the extensively re reworked coffins tend to not have many papyri included with that burial assemblage, that those deceased individuals don't seem to have or need the funerary papyri with their burials. Um, something that's like a simple name reuse, like going back to this example of Isidem Heb and Nessie Kansu, this type of reuse, where it's just a name that's being replaced, um, those burials tend to have a lot of papyri included with them. Um, and I'll take you through one example and we can maybe discuss why that would be the case. So this is another woman named Gaut Session and she has a full coffin set, which during the 21st dynasty included an, a decorated outer coffin, a decorated inner coffin, and a mummy board that would lie flat across the top of the mummy. And she also had included in her funerary assemblage three papyri. Um, now, why would a woman that had a full coffin set, so everything that could have been afforded to her in burial during the 21st dynasty was, right? Why would she include three papyri in addition to all of that? Well, this is her outer coffin. And you can see there's, you know, there's some damage there. The face is missing. The wig is very interesting. It's a checkerboard pattern wig that's not quite like either style. You can, you see they did include um, breasts here, but the hands, I know it's kind of hard to tell because they are missing, but they would have been fisted hands. So again, like this seems to be a gender modification that didn't actually happen completely or something weird is going on here. Because what we can tell is this is an image of the deceased. Now, does that look like Miss Gout session to you? Right? I don't think it does. So, so this outer coffin and her, her funerary assemblage in general was intended initially for a man. Right? And so, the image of the deceased that you see throughout the decoration of this coffin set is a man. Um, and here you can see on the side of, the, of, one, of one of her coffins as well, 
this image of a male deceased worshiping Osiris, you know, participating in a lot of the funerary rites, um, but clearly not an accurate representation of Gaut's session. Now, her name does appear on the foot of the outer coffin, and this is the only place on any of the coffins or the mummy board where her name appears. Everywhere else on the coffin, um, the area for the name is left blank. And you can see that here where I've blown up the image and there's this nice blank space towards the end. Um, but this would have been intended for a, 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 essentially the, a blank name of this male deceased if we were to believe that all of this was a single decorative layer, right? Where no uh, modifications or changes were made to this type of decoration, right? So she's not well represented in the iconography of this coffin set, right? So where can she be well represented? In papyri, right? In things that you can add to this funerary assemblage, right? So when you don't get a successful coffin reuse that accurate, accurately reflects yourself as an individual, you can use papyri as the add-ons, right? And say, this is where I can put my identity as a female worshiping Osiris. This is where I can list my titles within the temple. This is where I can list my family members that aren't being included in the decoration on the coffins, right? So this is where she can truly express herself and her social identity when her coffin set fails to do that for her, right? And, I, and now I know that I've talked a lot about uh, women already, but I, I want to continue with this thread. I think it's very interesting and important and see what women are doing when they are afforded this type of opportunity. And of course, my caveat with all of this is we are still within a patriarchal system. So women don't get carte blanche to choose anything they want without any type of oversight. This is largely still um, within, the within the control of, of the men in these women's lives, whether that's a father, a husband, a brother, somebody like that. But knowing that these documents, these funerary papyri are being created for individuals rather than families, uh, what can we see going on here that might be interesting for women? So first I wanna take a look back at the temple titles. And as we've already seen, men have many more options that are highly individualized when it comes to those positions that they can hold within the temple. Women have fewer options, they are less individualized. So if they can't compete, if women can't compete with their title and rank within the temple, how can they socially compete with one another? Well, I want to look at the content of the funerary papyri, see if there's anything interesting there in terms of gender. And I'll give you one spoiler alert now, and that's that women's papyri are on average a lot longer than men's. So why is that the case? And what are they putting in these documents that makes it that way? So first, let's turn to some of those temple titles. These are the most common titles that women can have within the temple system at Karnak. Right, and the majority, the vast majority, almost anything worth seeing on this chart is a chantress of Amu, right? And there are other titles. Yes, you can be a singer in the choir of Mut. Um, you can be a musician of Amu in some capacity. Almost all of these relate to, to music in some way. There is a Hemnetra priestess position. You can see very few people are serving in that capacity for either Amu Mut, Khonsu, or any other of the Theban deities. For men, there's a lot more in terms of distribution. You can be a god's father of Amun or Mut or Khonsu or some other deities. You can be a Hemnetra priest, a Wab priest, right? And or you could be a singer. There's a couple men serving in that capacity as well, but not very many. So there's there's a, a greater breadth of positions for men within this temple system. So if women can't compete uh, socially in terms of their hierarchy and rank in, in the temple, what can they do? Well, they can turn to content and the materiality that they have control over. And that's what I see going on with these papyri. So the vast majority, and, and I mentioned this earlier in the talk, um, the vast majority of content um, on these papyri are things like Book of the Dead, Book of the Hidden Chamber, the Books of the Earth, Book of Caverns, Book of Gates, right? Um, but there's a lot of what I will call esoteric content as well that some of it is more singular and one-off in nature, um, and we don't see it repeated um, a lot when we look at funerary iconography and funerary texts. And the majority of the, these esoteric cosmographic scenes 
uh, belong to the papyri of women, right? And so you don't have to be a specialist um, in this type of iconography to look at a papyrus like this, the papyrus of Harweben, and see that some things just look a little weird and different and off, right? So when have we ever seen a woman or anybody for that matter bowing down in front of a crocodile resting under a tree, right? That's a, that's a bit unique of a scene. You don't really see that very often. Um, even scenes like this Khonsu the child figure encircled within a sun disk, that's not completely unheard of, but it's a, it's, it's a bit more unique. This is not your standard, you know, Book of the Dead content in any way. We do have standard Book of the Dead content, right? So you can see the Lake of Fire here. That's pretty standard. Down here, where we have this jackal or almost like aardvark headed deity shaking a lizard. I, I've got nothing for you here, right, with this. Like this is, this is quite unique. Um, and it, the texts that are preserved don't really shed much light on, on description wise, like what's going on with a lot of these scenes. But time and time again, we see scenes like this popping up in the funerary papyri of women and not men. And the men seem to have much more standard and typical content. Why? Because they can compete through their titles and their rank with one another in the title. They don't need to show, I have access to temple knowledge. It's, it's written in their title, right? What type of access they have. But if every woman is just a chantress of Amu, how do they show, oh no, I have access to the best artists that have the best knowledge of Egyptian religion. I know more than she does about this because I'm more initiated into this temple system, right? We have other examples too, where again, things, you, you don't have to be an expert to see that things just look a bit unique or, or slightly off, right? Here, this example, it's not, this isn't a singular example. We have other examples of this where it's, it's like a, almost like a fire blessing of the universe. It's a very interesting and unique um, image to be included on a woman's papyrus. And here we have what appears at first glance to be a traditional image of Newt arching over Geb, right? A sky goddess arching over uh, a god of the earth. But we see Newt has an erect phallus. We see Geb performing an act of autofellatio. This is very interesting. This is something that we don't see very often. We see the same scene replicated again in a slightly different format where Geb is now anthropomorphized, right? Again, that's not, that's not entirely unheard of, but it is slightly more unique, right? And again, we see this occurring in the papyrus of a woman and not a man. Another example here, I think we can all rec recognize this famous scene, the weighing of the heart scene from the Book of the Dead, right? There's at first glance, maybe nothing surprising or unique, but you look at all of these additional features. You look at this seated child that is floating near um, this, uh, the seated Ma'at goddess, right, representing that feather, right? Um, we see an offering table being included where normally there is just more blank space, right? Um, we see uh, Thoth being incorporated not in his traditional format of a recorder, but perhaps referenced in this baboon that is seated on the top of the scales. We have a deity following the deceased that has the head of a mouse. That's that's quite unique as well. Um, not, again, completely unheard of, but, but quite rare, right? So we see in this papyrus of, of a woman, she is incorporating different layers of religious knowledge into a very standard scene. And, and turning into something much more esoteric than what we would normally anticipate, right? And so I, I gave you this spoiler already, but I'll turn to it very briefly, that women's papyri on, are on, on average much longer than men's, almost, um, well, and I should say first, the caveat to this is there's no difference in the distribution of coffin sets. Right, so I told you that the ideal coffin set during the 21st dynasty included an outer coffin, an inner coffin, and a mummy board. So three pieces, right? And broken down between men and women, women seem to have the same access to that type of materiality as men. So there's an equal distribution between men and women that just have a single coffin, men and women that have two coffins, and then men and women that also have those two coffins plus a mummy board. Right, so there's there's really no distinction there. So women aren't lacking anything else in their burial assemblage, 
that the papyri are compensating for. They have equal access to this material. But women's papyri are over double the length of men's if you just look at it meter for meter, right? And, and measure them all out and average those two numbers. And they're adding all of that esoteric content to their papyri in a way that men are not, right? And I find that very fascinating that you can look to this type of social competition within the funerary record because they don't have other means of self-expression uh, like they do, like men do with temple types, right? And so those were the three big takeaways that I have with this talk, that there's this, and they kind of go full circle, right? That this emphasis on state and temple titles rather than a focus on your connection to the king, because that's not going to get you anywhere. No one cares about those Tanite kings in the north any longer, right? So you're going to connect to the stable entity in your life that's going to protect you and your family for generations, and that's the temple. And we see papyri then take on a role of being part of these defensive burial practices that help maintain the hereditary structure of the, the temple titles, as well as allow for the individuality of the deceased to shine through when you're dealing with reused coffins that may or may not accurate, accurately reflect the deceased. And because women now have a lot more power and control over um, their burials as individuals rather than in association to a husband, we can start to see what those choices might accurately reflect in terms of female identity during the 21st dynasty. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, I see one in the back, and then I'll move forward. The, the use of males versus right, and I I don't know if you plan to include Q and A in this recording, so I will repeat questions just in case, so the mic picks up what that was. So the question was, um, is there any difference in reuse between men and women in terms of their coffins? The answer is no. It seems like both men and women are equally reusing coffin pieces, and I think one of the most interesting things with that is that gender modification is a big component of this reuse. It seems like it would be much easier if a woman dies to find a coffin of a woman so you don't have to go through this whole process, right? But that doesn't seem to be the case. So then you have to think of other reasons why certain coffins might be being reused. And I don't think it's outright theft, right? And I think Kara Cooney has proved that uh, brilliantly, that this seems to be a situation largely of families saying, this is my deceased relative. I have a right to this material and reuse that material. But if your family really only had access to one coffin, that's where you might need to change up a gender or something like that. Because if the last person in your family that died was a man and now you have grandma that died, you've got to make it work, right? So I think it, it shows that this isn't about like outright theft, but actually the inheritance of certain funerary materials that are then having to be re-commodified, right? Yes, go here. Yeah, you, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, in your earlier slides, when you were talking about titles, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering on what type of data that was based, and if that's actually based in a more stringent chronological format than simply the dynasty and the Ramesses periods, mm -hmm. because there might be more reasons than simply economic life. Uh, for the switch from one life to the other. The fact that you're dealing with the PMS, for example, means mm -hmm. that the king has moved so far away from the south that there is already less reason to directly connect yourself to the king because those, you, uh, those economical units will probably not be that frequently around or already have been obeyed by the temple by actually the grace of the king rather than simply them obeying it. Right. Yeah, so the, the question, oh, that's a hard one to, to repeat. Okay, um, so the question had to do with the titles that I was looking at for my data and to seeing if there's other reasons other than economic reasons to shift to an allegiance to the temple um, and where I'm actually getting these titles from and if there's anything more to do with the chronology of how these titles are being used through time. So I, a few caveats to the titles that I didn't include in the presentation. Um, number one, so the first big thing is I'm comparing 18th Dynasty tombs and Ramesid tombs to 21st Dynasty papyri, right? So that's a big, right? I'm dealing with two very different um, media here. Um, for the tombs, 
I excluded everything from Daryl Medina because that is its own special separate case where I think they have separate motivations to any type of family that they're listing there because those tombs were always meant to be family tombs rather than a tomb for an individual or a tomb largely for a couple, right? So that there's no evidence. I'm not looking at anything from their own Medina. I'm just looking at other Theban West Bank tombs of elites. Um, yeah, that's that's the big caveat with the tombs. The the with the tight with the um, titles on the papyri, um, it's it's hard. You're right. It's hard to compare chronologically because certain titles. Some don't even exist in earlier time periods, and so how can you make an argument that's, that it grows in importance over time because for whatever reason it's being excluded from earlier dynasties or something like that? I think the, the interesting thing, though, is, is that the, the types of titles generally do focus on associations with the king in the New Kingdom, the earlier part of the New Kingdom, and you do see that shift starting in the Ramesid period. Um, but you do also like you like you have examples of um, genealogies of the Theban priesthood from the 18th dynasty going all the way through even into like the 22nd, 23rd, 24th dynasty. So I, it's not that I want to say that like in the 18th dynasty genealogy and inheritance of titles wasn't important, but I do think that there is a case to be made that we know during the 18th dynasty in particular the kings did have a lot more control over appointing those people in the temple. And so for whatever reason, maybe it's the inheritance issue, maybe it is more of an economic issue or political issue, something else is going on there, that those titles were de-emphasized because most definitely these Karnak temple and other temples in Thebes existed and had administrators, right? But like those titles just aren't showing up in the tomb records. Now, like I said, I'm comparing tombs and papyri. So did those titles show up elsewhere? Were those all on the coffins or did they have, I mean, we know they did have some papyri in the 18th dynasty and in the Ramesid period, um, just not to the extent that we have here. But is that also um, a preservation issue, right? It very well could be, right? So I don't think in any way that I have a full picture, but I do think I have like, enough picture to kind of make a broad statement about a general shift. Um, but again, some of the motivations for that shift might be pretty murky. If that, I, I don't know if that, that, that's not a great answer to your question, and I do oh, apologize, but yeah. I want to make sure you are aware that there are mm -hmm. some rather drastic underlying issues. I understand you have to simplify it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is a rather extreme, complex issue that right. has many, many factors that really could hamper uh, oh, yes. an argument. Oh yes, I, I mean, in the fact again, just the simple fact that I'm comparing tombs to papyri with all of this, like that, in and of itself, is very, very problematic. And technically um, speaking, we should look at the country size level as well, because there you might already see that in different regions, certain types might vary. Um, oh yes, yes, all of this is limited. Yes, yeah, all of this is limited just to Thebes. So I can't tell you at all what's going on anywhere else in Egypt during this time period based on this data, nor would I ever want to attempt that with this data, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I don't want yeah. to disprove your uh, Oh, no, no, no. no. It's more yeah. Just make sure that you're aware of that. Yes, and this is something that, that at most can be anecdotal. Right, more than anything else, you can't you can't actually quantify. I know percentages and things like that. Those charts looked really nice and sciency, but it's anecdotal at best. Obviously, yes. Um, yeah. And you had a question? Yes. I just wondered about your statement that in the 21st dynasty, women had a little more autonomy in terms of mm -hmm. this is my tomb that I'm I'm designing or supplying, as opposed to having it done for them. I mean. Certainly, Nefertari in the 19th century has an immense tomb, but it presumably it was done by Ramesses. So, were the other 21st dynasty women not being sponsored by their family? Right. Okay. So that that's a a great question and something that that needs uh, unpacking on a lot of different layers, right? So the the first is you know an issue of agency and autonomy. I said at the beginning of my talk, the dead don't bury themselves, right? So whether you're designing a tomb or you're designing a papyrus or any, any anything at all, a coffin, anything at all. We don't know and we will never know timeline 
as to when these decisions were being made. It's quite possible that some of these design decisions were made during the lifetime of the deceased before they passed, and they had some sort of input. That's possible, um, but we don't know that. Um, it seems likely in the case of tombs, right? We can assume tomb construction began during the lifetime of that person, right? That they didn't wait until the person died. We, we, we know that pretty solidly in most cases, but you know, again, for the other things, coffins, papyri, we, we do not. Um, so when I talk about decision making, I'm, I'm really condensing a lot of different layers you know, for the sake of, of presentation into what sounds like a single person at a single point in time, and that's not the case. Um, the, de the deceased, whether it's a man or a woman, are not making decisions in isolation. If they are making any decisions at all, they're not doing it in isolation, right? This is probably a family endeavor. It's, of course, restricted to what's available in terms of material, in terms of craftsmanship, in terms of the artistry, in terms of the knowledge. If you have access to a copy of the Book of the Dead with this particular type of spell, or if you, right? So like all of that are restrictive factors within any type of agency a person has. Right, and then you have to you have to ask the question of like, well, who is paying for this, right? And it's largely going to be a head of a household, and that person is going to be a man, right? And I mean, yes, there's probably women that could afford, based on their position in a temple, to to purchase their own funerary equipment, um, but we will never be able to unpack that and know exactly who's making the decisions when and at what point and what options they had available. Right, so these are my limiting factors. Um, but assuming that men and women had similar options available, right, during this time period, I think it's interesting to see the types of iconography that women are choosing. And when I say women are choosing, it could be that the men are choosing for the women, right? And But for whatever reason, it is beneficial for this person to include such iconography and whether it's beneficial for her or the, for the family in general, for the children that are, are somehow trying to climb their way up the ladder of this temple system, right? Like, I don't know exactly why, but I can pinpoint the fact that a choice was made and that was the choice that they went with. And so there must have been some sort of socially beneficial reason to go in that direction. Um, but yeah, it's never it's never just one person making a decision out of any possible option on the planet, you know, with no money constraints, no time constraints. You know, there's always limiting factors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to just clarify something about the coffin of Gawit Session. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the one that had sort of the, the blanks for the male's yeah. name. And I'm just curious, is was that built? with the blanks in place? And if so, was that sort of a common thing where they understood that these coffins would be reused, potentially? Yeah, so I mean, again, we will never know for sure. Akira Cooney really likes the idea of even pushing it so far as to say there were like parish coffins where like it operated like a whiteboard, right? Where you could write a name, use it for the funeral, erase the name, go for the next person, right? So again, unless we had textual documentation that like that happened and there was essentially a rent a coffin system, right? We will never be able to prove that. Um, as far as I can tell with Gawit Session, it looks like a name was never inscribed. So then you kind of have, you have a couple different options. You do have the rent a coffin option. Um, you could say that this was an off the shelf piece that was meant to be purchased and inscribed later. Um, you can make that case for a lot of the papyri I study as well. That like how many of these were custom made versus how many were off the shelf, fill in the blank, and you know when it's sold and you use it. And I think for any object, ancient or modern, right, it's always going to be a gradient of an answer. I mean, you can think of any product that we use today. Think of cars. Some people get custom cars built for them with a custom paint job, custom interior. They don't, they're not going to go to a lot and pick something off a lot. They want to go and have it designed for them. Then there are the people that buy a really nice car off the lot and they're very happy and they buy it new. 
There are some people that never purchase a car, but they lease a car, right? And, and they know that they're never going to keep this indefinitely or, or have this notion of purchase and ownership. Then there are people that buy a car secondhand, right? And then there are people that steal cars and hopefully they go to prison, right? But, but do you know what I mean? So like if there's that gradient for with vehicles in our modern society, I see no reason why there isn't with coffins, papyri, anything else. Yeah. I just yeah. got to, uh, as far as like cutting the name blank goes, I suspect that it was always blank because mm -hmm. it's, I, you've, you've done the experiments with paint and yes. with the yes. materials and you know that erasing is not really possible. Most right. Of the time. Like, it, it's all water soluble. Mm -hmm. And then if you try to paint plaster over it, it's going to smear. If you try mm -hmm. to wash it off with water, it's going to take off the whole thing. Right. And uh, especially that varnish is. is like you'll notice that it was blank and it was varnished, varnished over. over. Yeah. And in that case where you showed the name that had been surcharged over the other one, they wrote over the varnish, and that's why yeah. it was so nasty. It was so messy yeah. and weird. Yeah. So I suspect that I I like Kara's parish coffin idea because also that I, there are several coffins that have both male and female deceased depicted on the coffin, and they have generic titles like Chapters of Amun. Yeah. And like. You know, Right. No, I I agree. I I I think it's a really really intriguing idea. And you know, it's like in your heart you say yes, absolutely, right? And then in your mind you say, okay, yeah, but I guess we can't empirically like prove it. You know, like we don't have like, but it's yeah, it's like it's there, <laughs> right? And just and when you think when you think of just the way people are, right? Like ancient societies are just like modern societies in terms of our anxieties, our fears, our desires, right? And so it's messy. It's not a nice clinical answer of this is what they did. And in all situations, 100% of the time, this is what they did. You know, so I think, yeah, some people resorted to the parish coffin. I think some people during the 21st dynasty could afford to redo a coffin set in such a way to really make it unique and look like their own. Um, and then I think there were some people that used a sentimental aspect to, you know, use a relative's coffin in a way that, you know, you might say, oh, but this was mom's wedding dress. Don't you want to wear it? Yeah. It's that same type of thing. And maybe you don't because it's ugly and from the 1980s, but you're going to do it and you're going to use this you're going to play the sentimental card because you are strapped for cash right now and you can't really afford anything else so you're going to make it work right so it's really easy to like find the religious or the social justification in something that is really based in a political economic landscape you know so yeah any other any other questions yes yeah. um you talked about the uh non-standard nature of the papyri and the linen mm -hmm. um, space. Uh, were there enough, was there enough information there to catalog or did you see any repetition or any correlation, say, between that and the length of the papyri? Or yeah. Be that they got some of these at TJ Maxx and they wanted to <laughs> write and you know, somebody didn't know what they were doing when they did the papyri? Yeah, so I mean, I, I categorized what I called the cosmographic scenes. And so I, I made a list and there's about 35 of them um, that I tried to describe as best I could in art historical terms, what I thought was going on, if I could see any parallels for where a scene might have originated from and how it was manipulated and changed. Um, I tried to indicate that as best I could. Um, like I said, a lot of them come from the papyri of, of women. There are some men, right? Um, that, that do have some of this content as well, but in, in much um, uh, fewer numbers, right, than, than we see the women. Um, I also think, and you, you kind of, you, you threw out the example of like, well, you know, it's like, do you maybe go to you get something that isn't quite right, or you go to TJ Maxx, get like a knockoff of something, and it's, you look at it later and you go, huh, that's not how that label is supposed to actually look. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily that, but, when you think about papyrus as a material, it's very easy to glue pieces together, right? So there's no reason to believe that for all of these documents, 
they were conceptually created as a single unit and then actually decorated as a single unit. I think you could have bought it almost piecemeal, right? You could have maybe had some sections that were custom and then you say, oh, that looks good too, glue that on next. Um, and then we're gonna go over here to a different artist because I really like this style of this thing. And we're gonna add that on. Um, some are clearly cohesive, right? And, and we know we're done by a single artist, you know, and that th there was a clear flow. Others, the borders don't match. Right, it's clear they were glued together because this section has a red and yellow border and then it's three inches off and it changes to a black border and then the next section doesn't have a border at all. And then it goes over. So like there are some where like clearly we know this wasn't conceived as a complete unit because you know, it's like the most schizophrenic looking thing you can imagine. Um, so, you know, again, I can't say exactly what the scenario was at each step of that production. Um, but it was it was clearly piecemeal. It was clearly like quilted together. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that gives you a definitive answer of what might have been happening happening, but I think the knowing that all of those possibilities exist are sometimes even more exciting than have one, having one singular answer, you know. Any any other questions? Was, uh, yeah. Some of these had, were made by different hands. Could you mm -hmm. see different, you know, scribes and stuff? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you can. Um, it's obviously, it, you can't compare handwriting and the images, right? So like that, yeah. So, so did you have a scribe that was also a good artist? Maybe, and they did both. Did you have a scribe pass things on to an artist that could do the images later or vice versa, do the images first and then fill in the texts? That probably also happened. So again, it's probably a mixture of you know all of those potentials. Um, but yeah, and we, we can definitely like there's one great example of a papyrus in Berlin where one of the one of the sheets is glued on sideways. It's the text is rotated. 90 degrees. So you're like, you have to turn your head this way to read it. So you know, like this was glued on by someone at a later stage of the game, right? That no one laid this out and said, oh, I think I'm going to turn this text around, you know? So um, yeah, so then how how do you acquire it? Is it opportunistically acquired? Is it is this something that is meant to be cobbled together like during your lifetime, like and added on to, like I, you know, the possibilities are kind of endless, and that's what's really interesting about it. Um, but then, then we have like the really nice tricked out custom pieces that you can tell from beginning to end. These were mapped out perfect, right? And there isn't a like a single flaw in the whole design. Everything fits beautifully. So it's you know it's everything and that in between, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.